All right, so I got a bunch of dumbass questions for you to answer. How does the electron know that in, how fast it needs to go in order to remain in an orbit around 100 nm? How does it get up to the speed or slow down to the speed if it's moving faster than that? It's 5 million miles per hour, guys. Every single hydrogen atom is identical to every other hydrogen atom. Got it? How does the electron know how to get up to that speed if it's not moving at that speed to begin with? How does the electron know that this orbital is located half an inch from away? Why not smaller or bigger? And so far, the charge is pushing it? Are you kidding? I guess not. The charges are not pushing anything. These are attracted to each other. Yeah. Why doesn't the electron collapse into the nucleus? Everything is identical, guys. These are the questions that you probably should have asked yourself when you were like four and forgot to ask these questions because you were really confused because the sky was blue and you didn't know why. I mean, this is the stuff you never asked. It's like, how does an electron know how to get up to the speed? How does an electron know where these orbitals are? This is an exact number, guys. All right, every single hydrogen atom is going to be identical to every other hydrogen atom. So if this electron is missing, it's going to get a new one, right? So if it's going to get a new one, the new one is going to be moving at exactly the same speed. So how do these charges know how to get up to that speed? How do these charges know where the orbitals are? Okay. Both give off light of the same color and have a crooked direction. Lightning and this discharge both give off a noise like a crack and both are conducted by metals. The electricity generated in the laboratory is attracted to a pointed metal rod. Since they are similar in every other way, will lightning too be attracted to an iron rod? Let the experiment be made. In the previous century, Newton drew a connection between the motion of the moon and a falling apple. In his century, a uh, century later, Franklin drew the connection between sparks in his laboratory and lightning bolts in the sky. Franklin hits on a method to prove experimentally that lightning and the sparks in his laboratory are exactly the same. They only differ in scale. The events of this fateful day are described by his close friend and fellow scientist, Joseph Priestley. Secretly, because he was afraid of being made fun of, and with only his son as a witness, he raised a kite into an oncoming storm. The picks upon it, there was a pointed wire, which was to draw the lightning from the clouds. They were in the storm for a considerable amount of time with nothing happening. Then, just as he was about to give up, he put his knuckle to the key. He felt a definite electric spark. Can you imagine his excitement? The exquisite pleasure of that moment. He transferred the charge from the key to the electric jars. The jars could then be used to perform the same electrical experiments as if they had been charged by rubbing a glass in the laboratory. The sameness of the electrical matter with that of lightning had been proven. All right, so Franklin's famous kite experiment. Two questions. I'm going to give you 10 points for each. The first one is the obvious one. So what was the purpose of this experiment? Why did they have, feel the need to actually conduct an experiment? In order to like prove that lightning is electricity. Okay, so Bailey, he was trying to prove that the lightning is electricity. Okay, I need more. It's not bad so far. So he was trying to prove the lightning is what? Is the same as the, the same as what he's producing in his lab. Okay, I'm, both of you guys, I'm going to give you 10 points. So he was trying to prove that the lightning is the same phenomenon as the sparks that he was generating in his lab, right? So there was a purpose to the experiment if he, if he had done the experiment. Okay, so the next question is, why did I say if he had done the experiment? Did he or did he not? Uh, did he lie about it or did he actually do the experiment? The reason why I'm asking this question is, guys, if you were to do this experiment, chances are pretty good that you're not going to survive it. And how do we know that? Because the next three people who decided to do it precisely the way he described it, one guy was from Britain, he didn't survive it. The second guy was a Frenchman, he didn't survive it. The third guy was from Russia, he didn't survive it. All three got fried. All right. So uh, none of those people survived it. We know today that if you were to conduct an experiment like that, you will not be able to survive something like that. So the question is... Uh, do you think he probably was? Thunder cloud with a positive charge sitting in the upper region, negative charge at lower altitude in the central region of the cloud. In the All right, so this is beautiful. All right, so after the initial separation of the charges, for some unknown reason, the positive charges rise to the top, the negative charges sink to the bottom. Of those two charges creates a potential, a voltage of several hundred million volts. These opposite. What's voltage or potential? They mean the same thing. Charged regions of the okay, so we'll discuss that about a week from the cloud are highly unstable and very attracted to each other. A lightning discharge is in some ways like a gigantic version of a common static electrical shock. All right, now this is the discharge, right? So you got the positive ions capturing the electrons. As soon as the electrons are capturing, when these sparks occur, with it's going to generate sparks in the cloud. They are called intercloud lightning. When the negative charge in one cloud flows to the positive charge in another, the result is cloud to cloud discharge. Sometimes the negative charge in the ground, especially in tall structures, will jump directly to the positive charge in the top of the cloud. All right, so notice that the Earth is slightly negatively charged. Bottom of the cloud, 
clouds are also negative. But the so the negative charge at the bottom deadliest discharge will polarize the surface. Our cloud to ground strikes. The Earth has a slightly negative charge, but the powerful negative charges at the base of the storm cloud. Okay, so I want you to take a look at the tree. Repel the negative charge. Top of the tree is slightly negative charge, causing that it becomes polarized. The ground to become positive. This is exactly what happens to you as well. During a lightning storm, the top of your body will become positive charge. Through when the attraction between these charges becomes strong enough, there is a spark. So when it's strong enough, there is going to be a strike. Okay, good enough. I think it is good enough. Let's get back to real physics at this moment. Is the force is damn? I mean, when you charge up this column, you're able to attract pieces of paper, right? The question is how. How do you actually transmit the force without any physical contact between the charges? Newton faced the same question about a generation earlier. Force of gravity, does it extend all the way out to the moon? We had that discussion before, so the answer to that question is it must, right? How do we know that the force of gravity extends all the way out to the moon? Because it uh, is still orbiting us. Because if it didn't, what would happen to the moon? It straight line constant speed. Way. Very good. Give yourself five points. Straight line at a constant speed. Ali also give yourself five points for the question. Your, uh, your uh, response. All right. Force of gravity must extend all the way out to the moon without it. Any contact between the Earth and the Moon, right? All right. So here's the problem, though, and this was a huge problem that Newton faced within his lifetime. Um, British obviously was highly impressed with Newton because Newton himself was British. French, not so much. German didn't really care much for Newton himself either. All right. So it was a nationalistic sort of stuff. Uh, British and French, they thought that Newton was a genius mathematician. Physicists, not so much. Okay. So it took a little convincing to realize that this guy was a genius. Okay. Here, here's the problem that they had. They said, if the force of gravity extends all the way out to the moon, how does the force get transmitted? Uh, they had a valid point. Now, watch this class, guys. I'm about to do something magical. Nothing. I'm just going to move it. Oh, this is a lot of fun. All right, notice that I'm moving the glass this way and that way. So the glass moves in the direction of the applied force, right? You push it this way in the forward direction. You pull it in the opposite direction. So it's going to accelerate in the direction of the push as well as the pull. All right, so what happens if I go through the same motion without touching the glass? So I'm pushing on it. I'm not touching it. So the glass doesn't move. I'm pulling on it. I'm not touching it. The glass doesn't move. So what's the main requirement for you to be able to transfer a force contact physical contact so the physical contact is required for you to be able to transfer a force so all of a sudden these french as well as german physicists they were skeptical as far as they were concerned this was action at a distance it was just magical they wanted to know how the force of gravity would extend all the way out to the moon and beyond without the earth touching the moon without any sort of physical contact between the earth and the moon newton being a genius that he was he came up with the best answer when he was confronted with this question he simply said i have no idea and, I, and he said, I feel no hypothesis, meaning that I don't, have, I don't have a theory. He had no explanation for it. He said, the only thing I know, gravity simply extends all the way out to the moon. Because the mathematics that he generated made some numeric predictions. The observations proved those predictions. That's it. Moon, instead of going in a straight line, it deviates from a straight line and falls onto a trajectory that matches the curvature of the surface of the Earth. It deviates from a straight line one twentieth of an inch per second, guys. That's the measured value which agrees with Newton's theory of gravity, 100%. That's it. All right. If the mathematical prediction matches the observational fact, then the theory is good. So Newton said, my theory is good. I'm going to leave it up to the future generations to figure out how the force gets transmitted. Gravity extends all the way out to the moon. Gravity is a force. But how the force gets transmitted, I don't know, he said. I'm going to leave it up to the future generations. And the next generation of physicists came up with the force field idea. So the gravity extends all the way out to the moon and beyond is a force field. Considered an instantaneous force by Newton. And we know today that the electric field does the same thing. Charges will attract or repel each other through an electrostatic force field, otherwise known as the electric field. You can map the electric field by using a positive charge or two positive charges or a positive and negative charge. Positive charges are considered to be the emitters, the radiators. The negative charges are known as the absorbers or the receivers. All right, so positive charge is going to emit the field. The negative charge is going to receive the field. Positive Q, negative Q, and that's it. All right, so the positive charge is the emitter. The electric field, electrostatic force field is going to be emitted by the positive charge. It's going to travel towards the negative charge at the light speed. So the positive charges are the emitters. The negative charges are the receivers, like the radio receivers. You got the transmitter here, which is the positive charge. You got the receiver here, which is the negative charge. All right, so electric field lines will start on the positive charges, and they will end at the negative charges. Like charges will repel, the and unlike charges will attract. What happens? So... You got these positive charges do, 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 coming from the ground. So you got the negative charges coming from the cloud and the positive charges come from the ground. Oh my God, now the lightning phenomenon. So the ground becomes positive charge. That's just polarization. These charges are not individual charges, just positive charges. The ground becomes polarized to become positive. All right, and then you got these negative charges coming down in high concentration and these actual positive ions going up. What causes the ground to become ionized? That's again, a mystery. Ground becomes polarized. It's not the same as it becomes ionized, all right? 
and then these charges meet. And when these charges meet, that's known as an electrical discharge. And then when there's an electrical discharge, the tremendous amount of energy is gonna be released. All right, so let's talk about that. So you got these positive charges going up. All right, positive charge is a positive ion. And then you got the negative charges coming down. All right, so here's the deal though, guys. Uh, thank you. These things are moving near the light speed. All right, so this thing is coming down, it's moving down at an extremely high speed. So it's got a tremendous amount of kinetic energy, right? And then what happens is it's gonna get captured by the atom. It gets snapped right here into the atom. Okay, so what happens to all that kinetic energy that it's got? Positive charges are going up roughly about 100,000 miles per hour. The negative charge is coming down at like 60 or 70% of the light speed. And then boom, this electron is captured. So what happens to all that kinetic energy that the electron has? All right, so all that kinetic energy is gonna get converted into heat. What else? Light. Yeah, hot light, what else? Sound. And then you end up getting sound, very good. Okay, so where do we get the heat, light, and the sound from? Transfer of energy. All right, the conversion of energy, right? From the kinetic energies of the positive and negative charges. Is that making sense? Yes or no? Yeah. Okay, of course you will say yes. Who wants to say no? You can give yourself the points for agreeing with something. Guys, I just gave you the sort of bullshit that you get from science channels usually on TV. Kinetic energy of these charges will turn into heat, light, and sound. Are you kidding? What does that even mean? What is light? What is sound? What is heat? Where do you get the heat from? Where do you get the light from? Where do you get the sound from whenever the electron is captured by the atom? Yeah, that stuff is missing, right? All right, so what is supposed to happen between the atom and the electron that's gonna generate heat? What happens between the electron and the atom when the electron is captured? That's gonna give you light. So once again, the same question, where do you get the heat from, light from, and the sound from? Any ideas? Oh, look, this is so cute. Looks yellow. All right, so at this point, we may have to resort to some kind of a political, politically incorrect analogy that you will remember. All right, so the analogy is gonna involve something real small. All right, so small is gonna be a midget and something big that's gonna be a normal size human being. All right, so midget is gonna attack this guy. All right, so imagine that this midget has a knife and he's upset and he wants to settle a score because evidently the normal size human being end up belittling the midget. So which means that this midget is gonna come after this guy. So midget being a midget, he's got a knife in his hand. So he's just coming after this guy. And then uh, all of a sudden, by the time this guy notices that the midget is nearby, it's too late. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna try to protect himself. Ah, well, you got the advantage, guys. Being a normal sized human being, you're gonna have longer arms. So what do you do? This guy's coming at you really fast. He's got a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. And then immediately you notice that you take some defensive measures. You grab the midget right at that point, right? You got longer arms. So what do you think is gonna happen? This guy is, as soon as you capture the guy, the guy's gonna try to free himself. He's gonna go this way and that way, this way and that way until he gets tired. Electron does the same thing. When it gets captured, it's gonna try to free itself. So it's just gonna be bouncing all over the, all over the inside of the atom, okay? So it's gonna end up losing that energy in the form of light. So it's known as a quantum jump. Or I usually say the electron is gonna go ape shit inside the atom. So what happens is the electron is gonna lose that energy inside the atom while jumping around. Every time the electron jumps around inside the atom, the technical term is called the quantum jump. The light is gonna be radiated by the electron. So what happens to the atom in response? What happens to the atom is exactly what happens to the guy who's holding on to the midget. All right, so the guy is much bigger than the midget and midget is trying to free himself. And this guy's afraid to let go because as soon as he lets go, this midget has a knife, so he's gonna get stabbed. So you have to keep the midget at the right distance. So the midget goes this way and that way. So you're gonna move with the midget, but not at the same speed. You're gonna be moving back and forth, back and forth compared to the speed of the midget. You're, you're not gonna be as quick, but you're gonna start to move with the midget. So what the atom does is the same thing. It's gonna start to vibrate slowly all right this is known as heat so where do you get the heat from you end up getting the heat from the random vibrational and rotational motion of the atom just like the normal size human being is trying to protect himself from a major attack where do you get the sound from guys did i mention that this guy's a knife what do you think he's gonna do with the knife he's gonna go he's gonna stab you bam 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 are you gonna sit there and say do it again no you're gonna be yelling and screaming right so where do you get the sound from you get the sound from adam's just screaming in pain right well that's where the analogy kind of fails everything else works out except for the last one so where do you get the sound from what happens to the air when the air is heated? It's gonna be heated to the temperatures at the surface of the sun. It's gonna suddenly cause an expansion, right? Sudden expansion of the air is gonna create a vacuum and then the air is gonna cool down. So what happens, everything is gonna snap back. The molecules will collide. So that is gonna cause the sound. All right, so the stuff that I want you to remember, where do you get the light from? You get the light from electrons jumping inside the atom. If they have excess energy, they will lose that energy in the form of light. Where do you get the light from? You always get the light from electrons undergoing quantum jumps. That's what we say. Where do you get the heat from? You get the heat from the random rotational and vibrational motion of the atoms. That's it. And the sound, obviously, the heat gets heated up. Air is gonna get heated up. Sudden expansion and sudden cooling down is gonna cause the molecules to collapse or they collide more like it. 